Now I'd like to introduce our first lunch keynote speaker. Emily Allen has come to us all the way from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Emily is a director and interior designer at Decker Parrott Sabatini, and she has over 10 years experience in commercial interior design. Her focus is on corporate office design and incorporating sustainable design principles that result in long-term solutions. I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you and welcome Emily. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Emily Allen, uh, as you just heard, I'm with Deco Parrot Sabatini. We are a collaborative, multidisciplinary design firm out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, we have 145 employees on staff, and uh, that broaches all disciplines. So we have architects, structural engineers, landscape architects, planners, and interior designers all on staff. Of those folks, 39 of us are lead accredited professionals. And as I mentioned, I'm from the Albuquerque office, but we also have offices in Texas and in Arizona as well. We do work all across the country. We do a lot of commercial interior design and commercial corporate headquarters. Uh, our clients range really broadly. So we have people who have a thousand square foot tenant improvement project all the way up to really large corporate headquarters. And that gives us a really broad perspective from which to work. But we also do things like community centers, hospitals, uh, multifamily housing, uh, schools, and retail space. All of those different focuses come together under one roof. And what that means is that a retail design might influence uh, corporate design, or vice versa. So we took that idea, and we took all of that expertise, and today we want to talk about reimagining the workplace, or reimagining the office. When we thought about this and we thought about doing a case study, we started by knowing that sustainability had to be a key component of that design. And everyone in this room has heard that we need to reuse, we need to repurpose, and we need to recycle. But we think there's a responsibility not just to do that with new buildings that we build today, have the ability to do that later, but really reuse what we already have in front of us. We also know that 40% of the workforce is going to retire in the next five to 10 years. So those folks are going to be replaced by future generations, and the workplace is gonna be more diverse than ever before. There's a lot of different ways to segment those folks. The differences between the baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, and Generation Z. And there's all sorts of stereotypes that we can put out about all those people and how different they are. But we had an idea. We thought all those people are gonna be in the workplace at the same time. So what if, instead of designing around what's different, we design around what's the same? Because no matter what side of the generational spectrum you fall on, our motivations as people are the same. It's a really long list, but to name a few, things like safety, well-being, personal connections, and money, all influence everyone in this room. We took that idea and we merged it with the thought that we really needed to reuse what we have, and we came up with a big idea. The big idea is this. If you co-locate multiple generations, you provide access to wellness, learning, and development for everyone, and you share resources among all of those people, then that creates community. From there, there's some key design principles that we followed. We said that first, you should eliminate redundancy. So this means that you should incorporate multi-purpose spaces, but you should also share resources. So instead of having a giant conference room for one person or one organization, you would share that giant conference room among lots of different users. You need to incorporate wellness opportunities, so on-site exercise is important, but also access to daylight and views for everyone, some key tenants. You need space to learn, to help people grow. So this is both traditional spaces and non-traditional spaces. Traditional spaces are things like training rooms or auditoriums, but non-traditional spaces are things like open workspaces and collaborative areas where you might overhear what someone else is learning right next to you. And we think you should do all of this 
while reusing existing inventory instead of building new. Because there's a lot of inventory out there. We looked at buildings built in just the 1980s, and we found that there is a huge supply of these buildings, and there's a pretty low demand for them in the condition that they're in. We have lots of clients who look at office space and buildings just like this and walk away over and over again. For this project, we picked a site in Albuquerque's uptown neighborhood, but for the sake of our conversation, this could be anywhere USA. Uh, it's next to a large shopping mall in suburbia, and uh, there's lots of access to retail, to walking paths, um, and to alternative transportation right within reach. Looking a little bit closer at the site, the site itself was overparked. There's quite a big parking lot on site. And the building itself is about 87,000 square feet, uh, seven levels high. It is a very typical 80s office building, very exciting, and it really uh, exemplifies the design practice that happened in the 80s. If you're gonna reuse a building like this, there are some challenges that go with it. So these are things like low floor to ceiling heights. We're also talking about small floor plates, inflexible cabling and networking capabilities, minimal insulation, and outdated HVAC systems. But we also know that with challenge comes opportunity, one of the big ones is the embodied energy found in these buildings. Embodied energy is essentially the um, manufacturing, the maintenance, and the disposal of a given material over its life cycle. So a building like this has a ton of steel and concrete at its core, at its foundation and its skeleton. If you reuse just the bones of this building instead of building new, that is enough energy to equate to over 117,000 gallons of gasoline. To give you some perspective, that's like taking a semi-truck from New York to LA 423 times, which is pretty good. 10 miles a gallon, if we're uh, calculating it. But not only is there opportunity for that, there's also opportunity to densify the site. These buildings are often in really good locations. And we have the ability to adaptively reuse these buildings. So that's what we did. We reconcepted this building, reskinned it, gave it a new face, and incorporated retail and residential with the commercial office space to make a mixed use micro community in one building. <clears throat> Taking a look on the outside, we'll do a quick tour. There are things like exterior patios. PV modules on the outside, south face. And as we work our way up, there's a multi-story walking path. So this is a great opportunity for people to exercise and end up on a rooftop garden on top, which is a great place to socialize. In addition, there are green walls on the exterior. And there's also some practical things like digital signage for an additional revenue stream for the building owner. We did take this through the lead checklist. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm pretty sure the folks in this room are familiar with lead. But essentially, when we took a big picture look, we think that we can achieve lead platinum uh, with 80 points right at the line there. We also wanted to look at it from a different lens though because we've been looking at lead a lot. Uh, we spend a lot of time focused on lead and it's a really great program. Um, but they've been working with an organization called Well. How many people in the room are familiar with Well? A handful, good. Um, so essentially, for those who aren't familiar, while LEED looks at how the uh, building has an effect on the environment, Well starts to look at how the building affects the users or the occupants. And it's broken up into uh, different categories, features, uh, concepts are first, and then under each concept are features, and then there are parts within each of those. And so listed up here are just a small handful of those. The idea here is that because we spend 90% of our time indoors, that buildings should help our health and not hurt our health. So as we go through the building, you're gonna see um, a few of the well points pointed out. We won't spend a lot of time because we don't have a lot of time. 
But uh, for instance, up on the roof, number 10, pesticide use, there's a protocol uh, feature that calls out a reduction of pesticide and herbicide toxic chemicals. And up on the rooftop, we'll kind of start swirling our way down here. <clears throat> the top story, or the seventh floor, is a um, penthouse uh, residential floor. And uh, this is penthouse to say that they're small units, but larger than what you'll see in just a minute. The building has a lot of on-site amenities. The idea here is that each user can have a smaller footprint, um, but then share building amenities to make it feel bigger. So as you work your way down on levels five and six, we have um, the micro-residential units or efficiency units. Someone could have a very small footprint, but invite friends over and use the community kitchen or the rooftop garden to have an event. There are no well points uh, pointed out on these two floors because the program is still under development for multifamily housing. <clears throat> so as we work down just a little bit further, uh, you'll find commercial office space on the uh, third and fourth levels. And these levels um, are essentially cleared out. They can be tenant improvements of all kinds, but the small floor plate allows for uh, daylight and access to views for just about everybody. There's a really efficient floor plate, and it works well with the layouts that we came up with. Cruising down just a little bit further, we're gonna get to the second floor. And on the second floor, we've got uh, that shared amenities space that I talked about, or, or one chunk of it. These are building amenities, so these are amenities dedicated just to the folks who occupy the building. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the green area are access to shared open exterior patios. And then in the purple zone, we've got shared building amenities. <clears throat> So the shared building amenities are things like a large multi-purpose room that can be used for training, large conference room, boardroom, et cetera, but it can also be used for community outreach or yoga, whatever suits the fancy of the particular user. Additionally, there's access to locker rooms and bicycle storage and uh, a community kitchen and break space for everyone. The community kitchen is a really neat part of this building because there is the opportunity for people not just from different office space to get together, but people in the retail zone, in the residential zone, and in the commercial office zone all have access to this space, which means that they have a really unique opportunity to run into each other. Uh, we call it a collision zone, places where people can meet when they wouldn't otherwise. And on the other side of this floor is uh, a, an office space that we really focused on. We worked with Clifton Larson Allen, they're a large national firm, and we talked to them about the accounting industry. And the reason we picked accounting was because it's a very traditional segment. We wanted to make sure that a traditional user could fit into a space like this. And it's not going away. It's going to be around for a long time. So while we might have really high-tech companies, really forward-thinking companies, we might also have very traditional practices happening. We want to make sure they can all fall into the same zone. So their office space is very simple. Uh, it's made up of simple, flexible pieces of furniture where an individual user could reconfigure their desk area without having to purchase new furniture. We also have a broad mix of uh, private space as well as open space so that different people from different generations or from different schools of thought can work in different ways, all in the same space. Moving down to the first level, we have a broad variety of community resources. So these are essentially the retail tenants, um, but what it does is it brings people not only from the building to a community zone, but also people from outside of the building, providing additional places to connect. So these are things like childcare, an integrative pharmacy, we've got pet care, a deli, a coffee and wine bar for after work. And then on the far right, you'll see we also have a co-work space. The co-work space is a place where entrepreneurs and uh, self-employed individuals can get together, bringing a further diverse component to this uh, community. All in all, as we worked through the building and as we took a big look at it, uh, we think that we can achieve well gold. 
Uh, I didn't talk a lot about the different components, and I apologize for that. We cruised through it pretty quickly. But um, in the end, we had about 57% of the optimization features. Uh, with well, there are uh, preconditions that you have to meet to be certified. And then if you can reach 40% of your optimization features, uh, that is well gold, and 80% are going to be your um, well platinum. Excuse me. So we took a step further, just a little bit further, and we also consulted with an energy consultant. Vibrancy is an organization in Albuquerque, and we studied what the different systems that we could use in this building to really make it effective. <clears throat> we started out with the uh, Department of Energy and their benchmarking database, and we found that simply by making this building mixed use instead of all office, there was a significant energy savings just by doing that. So without changing anything, it's an 18% savings or $63,000, which is pretty good just to get started. And then we looked really at the project itself and how we could make it even better. Um, the United States is split into zones. This project falls in 4B, or the dry zone of four. And there's a whole list of different measures that you could use from an HVAC perspective that would work in this zone. But they don't all work for every project. So we looked at a few ideas, and Vibrancy uh, put together a list of the things that they think work really, really well. So one idea here was to carve out about 1,500 square foot worth of footprint uh, for a data center. And the data center would essentially use the hot air that is inside the data center, pump it back through the crack unit and into the hot water loop instead of out into the atmosphere to help offset the water load, the hot water load. <clears throat> we were able to offset by about 10%, uh, which was pretty good. Additionally, we looked at using PV power. So you saw on the rendering a large scale of uh, photovoltaics. And we had started by looking at bifacial panels, because they look really good, and you can see through them, and it's kind of the sexy way to go. But we found out that they really weren't as efficient as we needed them to be. So we combined them both together. We used a combination of sun power and bifacial panels. Uh, the bifacial we used where we wanted to maintain views, and the sun power we used where we had a solid wall or something that wouldn't be uh, affected anyways. We were able to produce about a little over half a million uh, kilowatt hours per year. And what that equates to is about 50 single family homes. So the offset was great. On top of that, you'll see underneath that figure, uh, it completely offsets, more than offsets, the use of the data center. So if you were to use these two in tandem, you would have an offset use. The last piece that we looked at with Vibrancy was a chilled beam system uh, instead of a traditional HVAC system. Currently, I have nine foot ceilings, and uh, we were able to increase that ceiling height by about a foot and a half by going to a chilled beam system. Uh, in addition to the chilled beams, uh, we've got uh, floor displacement diffusers spread out on the floors, and it's a passive system, which we really liked because it meant we could uncouple different zones at different times. So effectively, in a mixed use, uh, location, you can have the office space running when the residential isn't or vice versa. So at night when the office space shuts down, you can uncouple that system and save some energy. So all of that being said, inside the building, we also have a little bit of opportunity on the site, or a lot of opportunity on the site, depending on how you look at it. Essentially, the existing office building is about 105,000 square feet. We have a six and a half acre site. Uh, downtown Philadelphia, you probably don't find that, but out in uh, New Mexico and out in the suburbs, it's pretty common. Lots and lots of parking on this site. <laughs> we propose that you would infill the site with an additional retail and residential building. This will um, up your floor area ratios by quite a bit, densify your site, and the development of those pad sites can help offset the development of this project. All of that being said, what we really got excited about when we looked at this was the opportunity. So in the neighborhood directly adjacent to this project, 
there are 17 buildings, and those 17 buildings are all opportunities for a project just like this. But if you take a really big step back, and you look at that number across the United States, 50% of the office buildings that are available today, the inventory available, were built in the 1980s. So that's a huge number with a huge opportunity. Thank you. It was a conceptual project. We've been working with the owner in a variety of different ways back and forth, but it definitely was our... Repeat the question, please. Oh, I'm sorry. He asked if it was an owner-driven uh, project or whether it was conceptual. We uh, took this project to a design competition to start out with, uh, and so it was definitely conceptual in nature, but we've been working with the owner back and forth since to talk about these opportunities. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Cost per square foot, we actually worked with a contractor to get it all priced out. Um, and it ended up being about $155, $160 a square foot. That's New Mexico cost, for the, for the record. <laughs> a little different out here, I suspect. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Zoning issues, there haven't been to date. It's um, a very... Uh, varied neighborhood and so it fit in just right but we haven't come across any to date anyone else yes sir Sorry. Oh. Question, building codes, building codes. Building code not as of yet uh, we haven't done an in-depth code code analysis of course but we haven't found any to date and there's a big precedent for mixed-use buildings across the country uh, and so just the fact that it's revamped we think it should be in pretty good shape now, there are, you know, there's always exiting issues and things like this with older buildings, but um, we're definitely manageable. So yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Well, um, because we took, the, the site was incredibly overparked to begin with, but um, because we took it from a commercial space to a mixed use space, the parking requirements went down um, and uh, we were able to get all the parking we needed with current code requirements, even with the two buildings on site. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, if you think about the energy required for a commercial office space, there's a lot of load for computers, for instance, and the equipment that goes into them, whereas in a residential space or a retail space, those loads just aren't there. So that's the big portion. Yeah. All right. Yes? Yes. No, that's an addition. Yeah, she asked about the exterior pathway, uh, the walking path that goes all the way up the building, and that is an addition on top of the face. Yeah. We were able to incorporate a part of the floor plate, but build out just slightly for that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, she asked about traffic mitigation and neighbors re related to density and densifying a site. Um, in this particular case, uh, it's not an issue because it's such a hub uh, in Albuquerque. Uh, if you had um, residential surroundings, I could definitely see that as being an issue, but because we didn't in this case, we didn't have to look into that too much. Yes, sir. Yeah. When we laid it out, we actually inset some exterior patios to make up for some of that depth. So we have some uh, sort of at the 
two sides, they all uh, jut directly to the exterior. The ones that had to be in the core, uh, they uh, set back just a bit in order to maintain that space. However, we were able to take a patio up with that additional space and give them that access. All right. Yes, sir. You know, we looked at both options, and Albuquerque is actually a really good place for natural ventilation, so um, we, we did both. Yeah. Different areas of the country are not as good for natural ventilation, but Albuquerque happens to be a great spot for that. It's a little warmer there today than it is here, also, by the way. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much.